What does it mean when it says Moses is like a god? We're going to discuss that and some other things in this uh, reading of the Bible. This is Wake Up to the Bible. I'm Daniel Kaplan, and I'm here with my father, Dr. Kaplan. We're reading through the Bible, uh, Genesis through Deuteronomy, over the course of this year, a little bit every day. Today we're reading Exodus 29 through Exodus 7-7. Or 629, uh, sorry. Yes, not not the chapter 29. Uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, and, it, and I'll actually go back to 28 because of that. Yes? I'd like to make a comment on the sure. genealogy in, in Exodus 6. That we just talked about? Yes, you find... And now somebody's calling me. Yes. You find that um, <laughs> uh, Aaron's wife was Elisheva or Elizabeth, mm -hmm. and that name remained in the priestly line. John the Baptist's mother was Elizabeth, right? And she was a, a, a descendant of Aaron. I just thought I, you know, I might mention that. Nice, yeah. Good and point. also regarding Judges eighteen thirty, uh, I used to try to fascinate, as I recall, fascinate my dates. I was at a small Bible college in Northeast Texas, and I would take out a Hebrew Bible and show my date to floating noon, uh, you know, as, as as a as some kind of a factoid, as my son Daniel pointed out, to try to fascinate my date. <laughs> Well, whatever works. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Remember, it was a Bible-oriented college. Yeah, uh, I'm sure it was. <laughs> well, for all those single men out there, maybe you could try it. See how it goes for you. Um, and it, yes, could we could we edit this? Can we stop this? Why the call might might have been critical. Oh yeah, 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 yeah. That's fine. All right. Yeah. All right, we're back. Everything's good around here. All right, so, and it happened on the day the Lord spoke to Moses in the land of Egypt that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I am the Lord. Speak to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, all that I speak to you. And Moses said before the Lord, look, I am uncircumcised of lips and how will Pharaoh heed me? And the Lord said to Moses, see, I have set you as a God to Pharaoh and Aaron, your brother, will be your prophet. You it is who will speak all that I charge you, and Aaron your brother will speak to Pharaoh, and he will send off the Israelites from his land. And I on my part shall harden Pharaoh's heart, that I may multiply my signs and my portents in the land of Egypt. And Pharaoh will not heed you, and I shall set my hand against Egypt, and I shall bring up my battalions, my people the Israelites, from the land of Egypt with great retributions, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord when I stretch out my hand over Egypt and bring out the Israelites from their midst. And Moses and Aaron with him did as the Lord had charged. Thus, they ju thus did they do. And Moses was 80 years old, and Aaron was 83 years old when they spoke to Pharaoh. All right, so uh, I'm just curious. Go back to 28, uh, 628. It has, because here it has, it happened on the day the Lord spoke to Moses, that the Lord spoke to Moses saying, I'm the Lord. That's just three times in a very short period of time. Is that the way it appears? That's 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 in the Hebrew like that. I'm guessing that's how he renders it. The all caps Lord. I just thought that was kind of interesting. It's mentioned three times. Yeah, between twenty eight and twenty nine. It happened on the day of the Lord that the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, "I am the Lord." I just thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, it's because now he's really yeah involving himself. Right. This is just three is the number of a decisive right point you know being made. To right. Some, you know clarity. And then again, he asks Moses to speak, and Moses says, I am uncircumcised of lips, and how will Pharaoh heed me? Um, and we've talked about that before, my theory on, on what that means, and that is essentially uh, the ability not to edit themselves, <laughs> more or less, uh, is another way of putting it. A not a refined speaker, somebody who's maybe too blunt, perhaps, is maybe Moses's problem. Um, not necessarily that he had a speech impediment. Because again, that doesn't really come, I mean, way, earlier we talked about how Alter translates the I'm slow of speech to a heaviness of tongue, and then this is your uncircumcised. This doesn't really seem like he was a stutterer. It seems like it's something, it's some other issue that he's speaking to. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that because he gives very eloquent speeches at the end of Deuteronomy. You know where he where he's speaking. Then I'm sure it's under divine inspiration. Well, is he speaking he, extemporaneously then? Because that could be the difference, right? 
because this is a situation where he's going to have to be in a debate almost yeah. because he has to he he does have his message to Pharaoh, but Pharaoh's going to have to have a response and he's going to have to come back with it. Whereas Deuteronomy, I think what you're referring to is a big oration in front of a group, right? Yeah. So that's not really the same thing. Okay, I see. You know what I mean? That's something that he could have prepared in advance and edited and think about it. It could be in the moment. He knows he's a little bit fiery and he is not going to be very good at the 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 back and forth, you know, the negotiation sort of talk. That's a very clever insight. Yeah, that could very well be. Yeah. And again, we 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 we've talked about this. You can go back, but we've talked about the difference between him and Aaron. Aaron is the type of person that would might build you a golden calf in order to appease you. So it does seem like he might be a more generous person in a conversation than Moses might be. Moses might be more of a battle axe. It's possible. I'm just I'm just speculation. I'm just throwing it out there because we do it doesn't, you know, in my opinion, it doesn't explicitly exactly tell us what the issue was that Moses keeps raising. But I don't want to I want to give him the benefit of the doubt that he's not just making up excuses that he literally is speaking to something because that's just the, that's my approach um now getting to the uh, getting to the main point is when uh god says see i have set you as a god to pharaoh and what exactly does that mean that is a very fascinating way of putting it don't you think yeah the word elohim is used sometimes that way for judges for people who have a lot of power who have life life and death power Sometimes the term Elohim is used for such people, mm -hmm. like in Psalm 82. You know, I, <laughs> I've said you are gods and children of the Most High. Here it's plural. Mm -hmm. Here he's saying you are as God to Pharaoh, and he, he means as God, uh, singular. Yes. He, uh, Elohim here is used really singular. Yep. Uh, as God to Pharaoh. I definitely agree with that interpretation of the Psalms and not what has become more trendy lately. And you know who I'm talking about, if you know who I'm talking about. Oh, yeah. <laughs> anyway, he, uh, uh, as God to Pharaoh, he, 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 he in effect, is, is God's messenger uh, in expressing God's will to Pharaoh. So, in effect, he's a stand-in for God to Pharaoh, mm -hmm. in a way. Yeah, well, the other thing, too, is Pharaoh thought of himself as a god in a sense. Ah, I mean, so good. it's almost like, well, he thinks of himself as a god, but you're really going to be more of a god than him. That's a very good point, and you're going to have an effect life and death power over him. Yeah. Moses is going to be declaring these plagues, right. or Aaron, you know, they're going to do certain things to bring on these plagues. Right. And, and, and that will overpower Pharaoh. Mm-hmm. And also, if you think about it, um, Moses is an is an antitype of of Jesus, right? So Jesus obviously is God, but he is like a god because he is similar in that way. You know what I mean? He's kind of a stand-in for the time being. You know, in a certain sense, it's it's a it's a common understanding that God was, uh, in effect, judging. The, the, the gods of Egypt, the powers of Egypt that right. the Egyptians worshipped. And one of them would have been Pharaoh himself. Right. And uh, later on, when we get to the plagues, uh, there, there are commentators who match up each plague with some f powerful force that the Egyptians worshipped. Right. I'll exactly. say more about that when we get there. Yeah, we'll talk about that. I have some thoughts on that as okay. well. Okay. Right. <laughs> of course. Um, so we have... Um, the one thing I will say is that continually, God is pretty clear with Moses what is going to happen, right? He constantly is saying, you know, go out, do it, and it's going to be difficult in this way, and I'm going to do this in order, you know, I'm going to, and he says, I'm going to bring up my battalions, which ultimately is the forces of nature, basically, is what ends up happening, because... He doesn't, you know, they don't really have to rise up as an army. It's like, it's God's army, which ends up being his control of nature itself, which is kind of interesting. Although he eventually ends up as the angel of death. But before that, you know, you have the forces of nature. So that's kind of interesting. Uh, and yes, go ahead. Uh, also, uh, he says, you'll be as God and, and your brother will be your prophet. Mm -hmm. It reminds us of the relationship of John the Baptist to Jesus Christ. Right. John the Baptist was a priest. Uh, descendant of Aaron, right, and he was the prophet for Jesus Christ. Moses was the right. antitype of of Christ. Right. I'd also like to mention. It also tells you that that God is working with Moses because again, Moses right. says, "I'm not very good at speaking," and he's like, "Okay, fair enough. You're going to be that source of power that's going to make Pharaoh really nervous, but he's going to be your PR spokesman." All right. Yeah. <laughs> so he worked with Aaron as well. The, the other thing uh, I wanted to say, it's important to keep in mind that we. Uh, 
there is a, a, a kind of pop culture view of uh, view of the story of the Exodus that, that is, you know, has become, you know, part of, you know, our, our heritage in the, right. in the Western world. But Moses was 80 when he came back. Right. And, you know, so 40 years had gone by since right. he left. Right. So you keep that in mind. That will help you give you a proper perspective mm -hmm. on the account. Yeah. And then we have Aaron is three years older. I'm and Aaron, 83, right. Yeah. So that'll give you a perspective on the account that for some reason Hollywood did not want to deal with, <laughs> you know. It's a shame, too, because so many stories we get now are about, you know, the strapping young man being heroic, and the Bible is more balanced than that. It does have stories like that, like Joseph is a strapping young man when he's placed in a major authority, but Moses is not. Moses is much older, and, it you know, it's nice to have stories that, that can give you, you know, as you get up in years, the idea that you can still be used for great things and, and you have, can have a tremendous impact. Um, and, and, you know, the Bible, surprise, you know, not surprisingly, but the Bible tends to be more balanced than what people tend to fall into. My son has reminded me of the Sabbath Psalm, Psalm 92. They shall still bring, bring forth fruit in old age. Right. They shall be flesh and flourishing yep. to show that the eternal is righteous. There's no a flaw in him. Yeah. At the end of the Psalm 92, the Sabbath Psalm. Yeah. Well, my dad's still, you know, cranking that stuff out there. So, you know, <laughs> <laughs> he definitely keeps producing uh, material, including this podcast. Um, let's see. Uh, da, 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 da. Yes. So, anything else about this uh, section is pretty short? We're going to keep going and uh, end up. Uh, so now here, yes, here Pharaoh is the one. Well, no, he says I will harden Pharaoh's heart. It does in, in seven. Yep. But uh, many uh, th 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 during this during this period, the, these chapters evidently you have ten times when when Pharaoh hardens his own heart, and ten times when God hardens Pharaoh's heart. Mm -hmm. And um, Alter has a very interesting commentary on this. Okay. Well, okay. Maybe, and you've read it, so maybe you'll. Yeah, well, share I, it I can us. share it. I have it right up. He said, It should be noted that the three different verbs are used in the story for action on Pharaoh's right, heart. Yeah. To harden, to toughen, to strengthen, yeah. and, uh, and literally to be heavy, which in English unfortunately suggests sorrow when linked with the heart, and so has been rendered hardened in this translation. The because this was uh, to uh, to make heavy is literally what it says, but he didn't want to do that because it seems like that's like making you sad. So right, he yeah. rendered it as hardened. Yeah. The force of all three idioms is to be stubborn and feeling arrogantly inflexible, and there doesn't seem to be much difference in the meaning of of the terms, although elsewhere, his ek linked with the heart has a positive meaning to show firm resolve. So yeah. again, that kind of gets to what I was talking about a few episodes ago, yeah. that perhaps... It could be positive or negative. Right, well also, but also rather than think of God as necessarily the puppet master, he's more enabling Pharaoh to be his most true self, versus wimping out. He's actually strengthening his resolve in his attitude. He's not allowing fear to cause Pharaoh to lose his resolve, as you could interpret it that way, which means obviously there's an impact on the situation. I'm not denying that, but what I am denying is whether or not God is affecting the morality of Pharaoh, which some people will do. They'll basically make it out like Pharaoh. God is the author of evil almost. It's it's It, it can get problematic in my opinion. Yeah, I, I agree with that, and I think that what, what, what in effect we're seeing here is that God is taking ultimate responsibility for, right. for what happened. Right. Because he could theoretically have softened it. Softened it, it yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. And essentially, that's always true, right? When people talk about sovereignty, right? There's always the possibility that God could intervene in any given moment. So ultimately, even if he's allowing things to happen, he does take ultimate responsibility. All right, so that being said, anything else or we want to move on? We're going to move on to where we get to the special effects. So that's fun and exciting. You have that to look forward to. And if you haven't, please like, subscribe, hit the bell. It's a great year to read the law, and we'll be doing so.